I'm Brian Steely. I've been designing for 20 years. I'm usually when I get up to do these things, I've got about 36 ounces of liquid courage in me, so <laughs> you guys bear with me today. I don't do this a lot. Blake asked me to do this presentation on symmetry. I said, hell yeah, I'd love to do a presentation on symmetry. And I, Blake's asked me four or five times to do one of these, and I figured he probably wouldn't ask me again if I said no. So here I am. Symmetry is prevalent in my art. Symmetry is not prevalent in my life. Um, <laughs> humans, as a rule, are flawed. We're unpredictable. We're messy. And I'm all those things. So I can find symmetry in my art and find balance there. Today, I'd like to just talk to you about growing up in Atlanta. I'm an Atlanta native. How many of you guys are actually Atlanta natives? Holy shit. Yeah, nice. All right. I'm Atlanta native. Getting past that, I want to go a little bit into my high school, college, how I became a designer. Show you a little bit about, about my work, uh, show you a little bit about my process, and then give you some tips that I've learned over the last 20 years that have helped me stay balanced. And, you know, I said I'm messy and all these other things too, so I, I still have to reflect back on these things. When I was a kid growing up in Atlanta, I had nothing stifling my creativity. Uh, my Atlanta then looked a lot different than my Atlanta now. I grew up in a bubble. I'd go out at, at day, when the sun came up and play with all my friends in the woods. We had no cell phones. We had no internet. We had no computer screens. We had nothing stifling our creativity. We'd create imaginary worlds. We'd build bunkers in the woods. We'd build BMX trails through the woods. Um, when it rained, we didn't go inside. We blew up our inflatable raft and raft down the creek that went in front of my house and rode that creek to Peachtree Creek and onto the Chattahoochee River. I'm glad my parents did not know about that because I would have gotten in big trouble. Fast forward a couple years. I was in school, my high school and college career. I was called a daydreamer, sometimes even a troublemaker. I was creative and bored is the near and short of it. I was struggled uh, all through school to find my place, to figure out what I wanted to do. I was always good at art, but I was always pushed in a different direction away from art. And I think the lesson here is you've got to stick to your guns and you've got to do what feels right in your heart and then you'll go in the right direction. I did not do this. <laughs> I went off to a small liberal arts college in Clinton, South Carolina, and I'm not a quitter, so I stayed there for four years. Got a great education. Along the way, I'm a huge music fan, so I was going to tons of concerts, um, and at the time, my favorite band was Widespread Panic. I'm not a hippie, I just liked rock and roll, and Panic back then was putting out some good rock and roll. So I would travel, being in Clinton, South Carolina, I could travel all around and see all the shows on the uh, fall tour. Um, and I found out they were gonna play a show, or a run at the Fox Theater, which is in Atlanta, Georgia, as you know, and it's my favorite band and probably one of my favorite venues. So I drew up a little sketch of what I thought the poster should look like, put it in the mail, because that's what we did back then, <laughs> and uh, mailed it off to their management, and I didn't think anything of it. A couple months later, I'm sitting in the house talking to my mom, and the phone rings, um, landline. <laughs> It's Westford Panics Management. They want to meet with me in Athens. So I drive up to Athens. I meet with them and a couple members of the band, which blew my mind at the time. And they said, let's do the poster. And I said, let's do it. <laughs> and at the time, I had no idea. I had not touched a computer, OK? I did not know anything about po tour posters other than this. I had this little book called Art of Rock. It was about this big. I couldn't afford the big version. <laughs> so I had this little teeny version. And in that version, there's an artist, uh, Rick Griffin, who I loved. He does a lot of, he did, he did a lot of Led Zeppelin, a lot of Grateful Dead. I'm not a hippie. Um, <laughs> posters back in the day. So this is the poster I did. It's not my best work, but for me, it'll always be one of my favorite pieces because I drew the entire thing with art markers, paint pens, 
white out, <laughs> double-sided tape, and glue stick. I shit you not. <laughs> I drew this thing, and I got done with it, and I drove it down to Athens. This is what, how we had to communicate. And I met with the band, and they're like, it needs to be 18 by 24. I was like, what the hell is 18 by 24? <laughs> so I figured out what 18 by 24 was. I cut a piece of paper to be 18 by 24, got my faithful glue stick out, and glued the design right on top, and just built it right out. So it filled the full, the full space, and then I drove it back down to Athens again. <laughs> So I, I might as well have been going to school in Athens at the time. I wish I had been. In that meeting, uh, Dave Schools, who's the bass player, who's the, the one of the nicest people in the world, said, hey, I love what you've done here, but could you make the dragon breathing fire? And at the time, the dragon had his mouth closed. I said, sure, Dave. Drove back up to my school, <laughs> got out a piece of paper, drew a dragon's head with the mouth open with the fire coming out got out an exacto blade which i just learned how to use <laughs> cut that bad boy out smacked it right on top of the old head with my glue stick <laughs> drove back down to athens <laughs> and delivered that thing like a hot pizza and got the hell out of there <laughs> they said how much do you want for this and i said i don't want anything you guys have given me so much and they said here's what here's what we're going to do for you we're going to give you two tickets and two backstage passes to any show you want to go to from here on out. That was probably the coolest thing they could have ever done for me. Um, I probably saw 60 shows and drank so much of their beer and did other things <laughs> backstage. and um, Just had a fantastic time getting to meet the band. Uh, I mean, just what, what a gift. That was the end of my college career, and I ended it with a, with a boom, kind of. Tucked that poster away. It was time to start finding a job. So I went to my first interview, which was a small design shop in Midtown of nine people. My interview consisted of, a, it was about 90 minutes. I uh, was a philosophy minor and an English major. So the principal at the time said, let's talk philosophy. I said, let's do it. <laughs> so we talked philosophers. We talked our favorite authors. He even made me recite some poems. I had to work hard to get this internship. The last thing he said to me was, you need to cut your hair. I said, all right, I can do that. I came in for my first day of the job, and um, he came up and shook my hand, and he said, I thought I told you to cut your hair. So back to the barber shop I went. I got my hair cut again. I looked like a schoolboy. And um, I had my shirt tucked in. I had my tie. I had ironed my pants, my shirt. And this is what my first day looked like. <laughs> this is the picture of my first day on the job. It was, my job was, there, there's a production table, if you can't see from this horrible photo I took back in the day. This is, our, this is a good camera back then. Um, <laughs> I took this picture, uh, all these boxes, this is about a third of the way through the job, but all these boxes had to be organized on these shelves that had not been put in the shelf slots yet, and I, they gave me a label maker. Have you all seen those label makers? I had to type in each, what each thing was and put it on the shelf. And honestly, um, I'm about as good at organizing as I am public speaking, so you can imagine how this went down. <laughs> Six months later, I still had the job miraculously. I couldn't believe it, but these are some nice people. And the graphic designer was leaving. so. I still hadn't touched the computer to do any kind of design work. I didn't know what Adobe was. I said, I think I need to go back to school for that. So I drove about three miles down the street to the Portfolio Center. Any Portfolio Center folks in here? All right. Small crowd. <laughs> um, it was a great school. It was a great experience. I went into the enrollment office. I was so excited. I finally found what I wanted to do. This is going to throw some balance back in my life. Um, went in the Roman office, the lady's like, where's your portfolio? It's like, shit. <laughs> I went back out to my car, and I had my panic poster in there, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, came, I came back in the school. I'm like, I lied. I have a, I have a kind of a portfolio. It's a, a one-piece portfolio. <laughs> Showed it to her. 
She was like, if I can keep the poster, you can get in. I think, I think they would have let me in anyway. They wanted my money. So they stole my money and my poster. Um, they told me not to have a job while I was doing this. Um, they probably told all you uh, three other people that went to the portfolio center in here not to have a job. Um, but I, I had to. I was poor. I was living in the basement of a house that had like this horrible like flag carpet with my dog that was a puppy that was peeing all over the place. Um, it was just, it was a high point for my life, but looking back on it now, I was so low. I, I had no money, I had no money to speak of. I was uh, sleeping on the floor of my office some days because I was, I was working so hard at night. Um, m the other intern would come in in the morning, you could always tell I'd been there because there's a um, trash can in our office and it'd be full of cheap beer cans. I was drinking cheap beer too. Because I could afford that. <laughs> While this was going on, my PR firm was becoming a marketing communications agency. So we were expanding. We had hired another designer and then another designer and then a video team and a photographer. And I was learning on the, on the go, but I was also um, a design lead on some big accounts. And um, other people were taking their leads. So I no longer was doing websites and um, brochures and annual reports as much. I was trying to do more branding and logo design and stuff like that. But um, I entered a dark time, as we all do. I was concerned that a lot of my work was being its very copy-heavy, uh, feeling very overproduced. A lot of it was controlled by the client. I, I, I felt like when I started something, it was great, and then when I finished it, it was not so great. I was getting frustrated. I felt like saying, don't tell me what to do, because I like saying that. <laughs> but instead, I said, what's missing? I was trying to figure out what's missing from my life, and I felt like the design world was swinging one way to this very polished, clean um, style, and I wanted to swing the other way. I wanted organic, I wanted texture, I wanted hand-drawn, I wanted natural, and more importantly than anything, I wanted simple. So, I started hand lettering, which we all have done, right? Everybody thought that was cool for a little bit, and it is cool if you're good at it. <laughs> um, I was extremely decent at it. <laughs> so that worked out for about a year and a half. I did all right. Um, and then I started sketching, and I was trying to figure out a way to pull my traditional art with my design sense that I had. So I started sketching again. And it had been a long time since I did that panic poster. My sketching was not that good. And it's not like riding a bike. You really have to work at it. So. I was like, well, I've got some computer chops now. Let's, let's jump on the computer and throw this thing in and refine it and make it look good and then mess it up again. So I created these textures that I'd add to give it more of a hand-drawn look once I'd refined the look on the computer, which it sounds counterintuitive, but it was really working. I was finding my rhythm. I was finding my symmetry through this art that I was creating. And I was doing all this stuff in my free time versus doing it at work. So it was providing that balance that I needed away from the job that um, was awesome but was not giving me what I wanted on the art side. These are my first two monoline illustrations that I did. I did not have any clients at the time, so I created my own clients. Fake record companies, <laughs> fake messenger services, I was doing this just because I was passionate about it, no other reason. I wasn't doing it to make money. I was doing it to find balance in my life. So I ended up selling both these pieces later down the line, and I sold um, my messenger service stuff too. But my first piece that I sold was a piece for Essence Music. It's a Brazilian record company that seemed awesome at the time because I love vinyl, and they were going to put my logo on vinyl, and I don't think that, that it gets too much cooler than that. But it never happened. I got half the money, and I have not received any of the records, so <laughs> lesson learned. <laughs> My next piece, I got this email. I need a logo. No period, no capitalization. <laughs> <laughs> I, I fired back, I need a lot of things. 
And uh, the guy's like, oh, sorry, this is Campbell Milligan. I'm the founder and creative director for Monster Children. It's like, oh, shit. <laughs> um, so I knew, I knew exactly who he was. I knew the magazine very well. Um, Love the magazine. And um, it, was, it was an honor to get to do something like this. Like when I was loving what I was doing on the side, this passion thing that I was doing and getting to do it for Monster Children. I was like, this is just blowing my mind. So in this piece, you can see a lot of the texture, like how I roughened it up. Now let's move on to the next piece. Kind of, I'm kind of taking you through like this p progression through the monoline style. Um, I got this job through Dribble. I had a buddy that was working at Element. He's like, would you like to design a skateboard deck? Well, hell yeah. I mean, <laughs> who doesn't want to design a skateboard deck? I, I skated my whole life, so I was like, this is, this, is a dream. this is even more of a dream than Monster Children. <laughs> so I designed one deck. He said, hey, would you be up for doing a series of decks? I was like, yeah. He's like, well, I need them back at the end of the week. <laughs> okay, so I was working full-time at my job. I was working full-time at home. We had two kids, me and my beautiful wife, and I, I, well, she was being really cool about it, but I realized that this was not going to last forever. <laughs> I get a call, a call from Nike. They wanted me to do 12 um, college, college football illustrations and 12 NFL illustrations, and I'm like, now this is getting big. Um, I need to figure something out here. So. I was working 40 hours in the office, 40 hours out of the office, trying to raise these two kids with my wife. Something had to give. Um, I went to my agency and I said, I'm either gonna have to leave or we can work some kind of agreement out where I can stay here with you beautiful people and we can continue to make magic together. <laughs> my agency is amazing, Jackson Spalding. And we decided to continue to make magic together. We opened Steelyworks. Uh, we're in the third year. Everything seems to be going pretty good. <laughs> on my end, I don't know on their end. So. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about my process. My process is probably very similar to all y'all's processes, but I have to move really quick through these things sometimes. So I've got these questions that I ask myself before I do anything. What makes the object interesting? What characteristics make it unique? What can be eliminated and still quickly convey the concept? I've probably got 10 other questions I can't share with you because they're top secret. <laughs> um, but that's a few of them, just a little tasting. So then I go into like reference um, research mode and I pull elements that I, I think are going to be needed and like look for shapes that are going to need to pop out. And uh, this is like a quick mood board I threw together. This is me sketching. <laughs> it's a great photo. Thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> this is a sketch that I did. This kind of conveys how rough my sketches are. I use my sketches as a blueprint to throw down on the computer to trace and refine, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but I do try to get everything, the proportions right. Uh, it makes it easier in the long run. This is the finished product. I don't know if any of y'all, probably some of y'all been to the Argosy, right? Yeah. All right. So the Argosy is this beautiful bar in East Atlanta. It doesn't really look like it belongs in East Atlanta, but it's there. <laughs> um, and when I went into the Argosy, I had been going there for years. It used to be this flea market. And it, when I walked in there, I was just blown away. It had completely trans, they had completely transformed it. I think they probably did over a million dollars worth of renovations to create the masterpiece that they had. And I was enamored. I went home and I drew some sketches and created some logos. And I was ready to give them a logo for free because they spent a million dollars on renovations, but they had a clip art logo. Now, if one of y'all did that logo, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> It, w it was not a good logo. <laughs> I don't like to call people out, but I I'll call them out on this one. The, the owner looked at me like I was crazy and said he was not interested and sent me away with my tail between my legs, feeling like, man, this is never going to happen. Um, that was eight years ago. Five years ago, I get a phone call from the same gentleman asking me if I do their logo. 
I said, sure, but this time it's going to cost you. <laughs> My company has five C's that we use in hiring people. Let me see if I can get four of them. <laughs> Class, character, chemistry, confidence, and competency. <laughs> Boom, I got all five. Okay, so I've got five S's that I use for creating my work. Symmetry, stroke, sans serif, simple. And I was doing an AIGA talk last year and somebody yelled out, Steely, because I needed a number five. And I was like, thank you, Steely. So symmetry is important, obviously, for keeping the balance. Stroke, I find very important, too, because I can create depth with stroke, like using different stroke widths. Uh, it's hard to get depth with lines, so that's really the only way to do it. Um, sans serif, I, I'm a horror with sans serif fonts. I love them, um, and they work really well with my style, so I tend to use them as very often. Simple, I think simple is always the way to go. And then, of course, me, because I'm doing the work. <laughs> I'm going to take you through a few of my projects that I've done that are kind of bucket list things for me that are not my best work, but I just think that they were cool, like little stepping stones along the path. So this was uh, Collected Works, is the record label for the new pornographers. My kids uh, kind of flinched when I said the new pornographers, and I'm like, no, 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 it's not like, they're not porn, no, no, no pornography here. But they are a great band, and they paid me, and they also actually put my logo on their record, so... Check that off the list. And I own the vinyl. That's my face in the background through the... Can't really see it. <laughs> this is one of the cooler projects I've gotten to do. I wish it looked better on the screen, but Nod Hill came to me. Um, they're a brewery in Richfield, Connecticut. And they wanted a logo that had a campfire, a meeting space, a hill, and a moon or a sun. And so... I'm like, what if we get glyph-like with this thing and we create a campfire that's part of a hill that's also part of a tent and then a moon will wrap up behind, or a sun will wrap up behind it. They loved it. It became their logo. And since that, they've hired me to do the packaging for the beer cans. Uh, this is cardulous. It's a type of bird I was unfamiliar with, but that's what a cardulous looks like if it has a spacesuit on. Um... <laughs> It's a Galaxy IPA, so of course I threw a space scene in there, and the astronaut Cardulus is with the uh, keg on their backs instead of the oxygen pack, pack so they stay hydrated in space. <laughs> I've got a hop um, UFO in the middle, transmitting the beautiful hops down to our wonderful planet. <laughs> and then, of course, the, the whole thing's built on this symmetrical uh, grid um, that I use for all their cans. They've started creating their own cans, and um, so not all of them are mine. Um, Newport Folk Festival. Uh, has anybody been to the Newport Folk Festival? All right. <laughs> Newport Folk Festival is probably one of the best festivals in the nation, in my opinion. Um, I've always been a fan because that's where my man Bob Dylan plugged in and went electric for the first time. So it's always had like a little special place in my heart. I got to print this thing with the great uh, folks at Danger Press. Um, we printed it with silver metallic ink on this beautiful uh, night shift blue French paper. And I was thrilled. We sold these things. I got to go to the Newport Folk Festival with my family. We even got to go backstage and see Ryan Adams. <laughs> um, anyway, it was a great time. Another thing I really always wanted to do was a head badge for a bike. Not just a head badge, but a metal head badge. I don't know why, but I did, and that was on my bucket list. And this guy um, from Brooklyn, a frame builder in Brooklyn, came and said, hey, man, I'd love for, for you to do a badge for my bike and some branding. I'm like, how much money do you have? A couple hundred dollars. I was like, uh, okay, I'll make a deal with you. You build me a bike, and you put a metal head badge as your head badge, and we've got a deal. So I've created this owl, which I, I think is the fiercest animal in the world. It makes no noise as it flies through the air, ripping its prey out of the air, tearing it apart and eating it. 
And I mean, you can say like a tiger's, you know, more fierce, whatever, but no way, owl. <laughs> I mean, if an owl was as big as a tiger, it would, it would mess some stuff up. <laughs> Fiercely made in Brooklyn is his uh, little tagline, and that's my bike right there. I like to show this one because I drew it uh, last year on my sabbatical. At my agency, we get a sabbatical every 10 years, which is a month off, paid leave, and they encourage us not to do any work while we're gone. So me, I, I can't ever put my pencil and my pad down, so a guy came to me, he was opening Sabbath Brewing, and he said, will you make a logo for me? And he had no money too, so we agreed that I would drink beer for free there until they closed. Um, and he also threw in the fact that I could take growlers home with me. I'm like, you do not know who you're dealing with. <laughs> so I drew all this lettering by hand, and um, the snake obviously wraps up into an S around a barrel. It was, on, it was based on this, I can't remember the name, but the snake wrapped around an egg. Yeah, somebody in here probably knows. But anyway, that's some of my work. I'm going to tell you about some things I've learned along the way that really helped me become a more grounded, more balanced designer. I set goals every year. At our agency, we're asked to set three or four goals every year. And to me, goals are not an end point, but they're points on our journey. So make sure you've got another a point out there ready to go to the next goal. Stay in control. I spoke about this earlier. I'm horrible about staying in control. The only reason I can stay in control now is I've got a style that people come to me for, so it makes it easier to produce. But staying in control with clients is a really hard thing to do, and it's an art. So work on that, and then come tell me how you do that. <laughs> Own it. You work hard to develop your style, and once you do, don't let up. I worked really hard to create th this monoline look, and I'm constantly like adding different things and tweaking it. People don't always like it, but I'm exploring and I'm trying to evolve it. So once you get your style, just keep going after it. Passion. Does everybody have passion for what they do? Yeah? You don't sound like it. <laughs> you gotta do a better job than that. <laughs> Does everybody have passion for what they do? Yeah. I mean, look at this industry we work in. We're creatives. We get to have, do these awesome things and create these works of art. Um, it's just a beautiful, beautiful industry we work in. And there are a lot of people that um, are going to just jump right over you if you don't have passion. And uh, there's no point in playing the game if you don't have passion. Collaborate. Get others involved. I mean, I'm doing this thing on my own pretty much, but I've got a good friend, Robert, over there that animates my stuff, and I've got other friends that help me with the website. I'm constantly asking questions to my team about how can I make this look better. It's so important that you get somebody else involved to go far with the work. And last, but definitely, definitely not least, <laughs> don't be a dick. Because if you are, people are not going to hire you. They're going to forget about you. You burn bridges. You act like an asshole. People are just going to forget about you. Don't do it. Don't be a dick. That's all I got.